How you guys doing? Doing good? You look good. Actually, you, you will look good. Steve, if you could turn the lights on so I can see how, how good these guys actually look. Oh, yes. You do look good. Come on. Look at the person next to you, if, if they're married to you, and say, you look good. Yeah, if you're not married to them, you just go ahead and keep your mouth shut. Hey, goodbye, kids. Have a great time. Awesome. Now that they're gone, let's really get in. Hey, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to uh, John chapter 19. Uh, we want to greet everybody watching online this morning. In fact, let's just, let's just welcome everybody online this morning. <laughs> welcome. You are loved. See, we're, we're clapping for you. Awesome. And recognizing that so, we have so many dear friends and family that are part of Sierra Bible Center uh, that, that really can't be here uh, because of uh, COVID-19. And so we do. We love you online. And, um, uh, uh, and, and God is going to minister wonderfully in your home, in your home today. Um, hey, today we're going to be, be continuing our, our series on um, uh, Jesus is King. And we're going to be looking at Jesus as uh, the suffering king. And we're going to do this on purpose. I am hoping that we can actually dive into a certain part of the character and nature of Jesus um, because I think that there's going to be something that gets to shift or adjust before we go into 2021. A lot of people think that, um, that a new year um, uh, is an opportunity for us to be the new us. And so we frame out all of these new expectations on ourselves that will magically happen because, after all, it's a new year. Yeah, and, and, and you see that, and you got all these people that purchased their gym membership. You know, how many, how, many, how many of you have ever been to a gym on, let's go January 2nd. Like, nobody goes to the gym on January 1st, but let's say, like, January 2nd or January 3rd. It, it is packed out. Everybody's there. They got their new workout gear that they got for Christmas. They're just like on their treadmill, you know, or if they're on their bike, they're doing their bike thing. Um, ex I guess except for this year, we're not going to add that because of the pandemic, which I already forgot about. <laughs> I'm kind of in denial. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, usually, you, maybe not this year, but usually the gyms are full on January 2nd. And then if you go on January 31st, it's like the gym is empty again. And, and, and you get to actually kind of see how long the, the, the and, and the reason why is that for a lot of us, um, we brought the 2018 us into 2019. And for a lot of us, we brought the 2019 us into 2020. And, and, and if you are wonderful, and if you are, just, and if you are just partnering with the Holy Spirit and God is doing a glorious thing, then awesome. Let's transition from, from 2020 into 2021. But um, it, it, perhaps it's not the desire of your heart to take the 2020 you into 2021. And maybe, maybe there are patterns within your life that have, that have established themselves within your life and, uh, and maybe you just think that's the way it's always gonna be. And I got good news to address that, to address the lie that this is how it's always going to be. This is how it's always been. This is how it's always gonna be. This, 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 I, I'm, I'm gonna break that with this, with this statement. Jesus is king. Okay, good. I'm going to say it again. But I'm going, to add, I'm going to add a word. You ready? Jesus is our victorious king. And what we're going to read here today is that, um, that our king is victorious even though he experienced suffering. And so let's read John 19, verse 14. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour when Pilate said to the Jews, behold your king. This is total mockery. He's totally making fun of Jesus because Jesus looks dejected. Jesus looks unkingly like he's 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 facing a death sentence here okay so Pilate is mocking Jesus he says behold your king and then they cried out away with him away with him crucify him 
Then Pilate re responded and said, shall I crucify your king? So again, Pilate's just playing games. He's, he's taunting the people. He says, um, really? You want for me to crucify your king? So Pilate's just having a game of this. And the chief priest answered and said, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to be crucified. They took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus was in between them. Pilate also wrote on, on an inscription, he, he, he made this sign, and he put it on the cross above Jesus. This, 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 was, this is what they did um, upon crucifixion is that they would um, carve out um, the accusation of why you're being crucified. So they would put your accusation above you. And so this is, this is the accusation they wrote, that Pilate wrote about Jesus. It said this, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, many of the Jews that read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was also written, so it was written in multiple languages. Look at Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews, they did not like this at all. Like the chief priests, they, they, were, they were triggered. They said, do not write this, the king of the Jews, but rather this man said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered and said, I've written what I've written. <laughs> Let's pray. Jesus, you are our victorious king. And your spirit is in us and with us. Your spirit is in this room. And your spirit has been assigned to our region that you are here. And we declare, God, you are here. And for people that are watching online, I thank you that you are there as well because you are not separated by time or space. Lord, we thank you for your victorious presence that is willing, that is willing to go back into our past, to apply your oil over memories and situations so that we do not have to be tethered to the past or tethered underneath a principality of suffering, but that we would get unhooked that we would get unanchored to every counterfeit Messiah and every counterfeit Savior, that we would attach ourselves to the Son, that we would attach ourselves to the one who did not run away from pain, but he ran into it. He embraced it because of great love. So, Lord, we thank you for your presence that's here. And, Lord, we pray, Father, for an impartation of your grace this morning that would empower us to remain to not quit, to not give up, to not forsake this incredible destiny that you've called us to. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in this place this morning so that your kingdom can come and your will can be done, established through us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. Sometimes we feel like there can be a contradiction between suffering and glory. And we see this sometimes even in the charismatic church in that we can go through incredible difficulty and not tell anyone about it. We can be uh, uh, quite private when it comes to our own um, suffering because sometimes it feels like a suffering, like there cannot be suffering and glory remaining in the same, in the same vessel. The problem with that is Jesus, Yeah? And so we see um, this king, he called himself a king. He's always talking about the kingdom, right? And yet here he is being presented as a king. And it's, and it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a huge contradiction. Why? Because it's a suffering king. And kings don't normally suffer. Here is this king that's being presented as a suffering one. A king should be honored. But this king is being scorned and shamed. 
A king should be clothed with royal robes. And this king, our king, he's being presented um, in this place. I think of him hanging on the cross, not in royal robes, but hanging on a cross as a, as a common thief, clothed, not in royal robes, but in his own blood. A king, a god, yeah, should be all-powerful. And here is our God that has become flesh, and he is appearing quite weak and quite vulnerable. And for this reason, I think that when we go through suffering, if you've been through suffering in your past, I don't think you need to try to cover that up. I don't think you need to, I don't think you need to pretend like that, that, that didn't happen. Because no matter how much we try to pretend on the outside, how do you know that it's the inside that dictates how we're going to live, the behaviors that, that we make, how we're really, you know, and how many have ever tried to keep your inner space from affecting your outer space? Wave at me. How many of you have ever said to yourself, I'm not going to allow what I'm thinking to control how I'm living? The problem with that is as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. When I was a kid, which was a long time ago, okay, we had these things called vinyls. We had these things called records. You know what a record, yeah, a record. And it, it, so my mom would get these records from the library and um, we, I used to do the audio books. And so we had Treasure Island. And I remember the, the, the records from the library were the worst. And the reason why is because they were always scratched up. I, I remember I, I even had like a, a, a Superman record. And you put on the Superman record. And like re, you'd be really starting to get into it. And all of a sudden it would hit a scratch. Now on, on a record player you've got the little needle. And it's, and it's grazing across the landscape of the vinyl. And it's, and it's riding a groove. It's riding a path. And this pathway it begins on the outer side of the record until it makes its way all the way to the center. Well, when you've got a... Welcome, guys. I'm just talking about scratch records. Okay. T hopefully everyone's taking notes. When a needle gets to that scratch, what happens? It hits, the, it hits the scratch, and then the needle pops back. It pops back a tick. So you'd... you'd uh, like on um, Treasure Island, you'd have... And young Jim Hawkins climbed aboard and young, that was bad. And, okay, let's start again. And young Jim, and young, that was bad too. Young Jim, young Jim, young Jim, young Jim, young Jim, young Jim. You, okay, that was a little better. And young Jim, young Jim, you know. Okay, good. All right. That's kind of a picture of what our life can look like. We're on this journey from the outside into the inside. We're on this thing. We're all riding this. We're, we're riding our groove. We're doing our thing. And, 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 and we're, we're waking up to who we are in Christ. And we're on this, on this destiny journey. And yet we can keep hitting this, this, this scratch. We can keep hitting this, this record of, of, of trauma. We can he, keep um, hitting this memory. And what, is the, what does the memory do? It throws us back. So we're... We're moving, you know, <laughs> we go to SRC, we read a prophetic book, we went to a conference, we got the breakthrough, and bah! and it resets us back to 87, it resets us back to 95, it resets us back uh, to 2013, and you're like, seriously, I gotta, I gotta do this again? So what does the enemy come to do with suffering? He comes to shame us. He comes to say, this is who you are. Okay? And this is who you will always, this is who you will always be. There is no glory in, 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 in suffering. And the thing about this is when we see Jesus on the cross, Jesus says in Matthew 26 or 53, he talks about his supernatural ability and relationship with the Father to summon angels to come and to rescue him if that's what he had desired. He says, do you not think that I can call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? It must happen this way. 
The reason why um, we're talking about this is because we're a supernatural church. We believe in the power of God. We believe in his um, uh, desire for us to execute justice. That's why you attend Seattle Revival Centers, because we've got similar core values. We believe that we're not just here to occupy a plant. We believe that we're not just here to work jobs and and have lots of babies, even though that's fun. We believe that God in eternity past knew us. He knew us intimately. He formed us and framed us for the earth for such a time as this. Say amen, because that's a good word. Yeah. So we believe these things are true. We believe that he has... Um, uh, 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 his desire to release his supernatural power in order to bring forth justice, which is the same thing as to restore joy. Because we know that joy isn't necessarily the same thing as happiness. When we say, joy to the world, we're not saying, may the, may the world be holly and jolly and Now, I'm a happiness guy. I love happiness. But the word joy actually has more in common with shalom than it does happiness. And what is shalom? Shalom is peace. That's good. But the problem with peace is that when we think of peace, oftentimes we think that that means a ceasefire between nations. We think that that means a world without war. But what shalom means is that everything on earth is functioning according to God's original intent and design. We see God's willingness and ability to execute his shalom. And to step into the fracturedness and the chaos, to step into every scratch within our past, to step into all trauma within our past, and to show up there and to minister there. But it requires for us to be willing to partner with his presence, his purpose, his power, and his nature as victorious. Are you willing to not allow your past suffering to define you any further. Now that seems easy. That seems like that should be an easy thing. Like, yes, I am willing to not allow my past suffering to, you know, to define me any further. The problem is, is that if we're honest, a lot of times we find our sense of identity and value right in the midst of our suffering. It's almost like our suffering becomes synonymous with who, in fact, some people, even subconsciously, will use past suffering to find immediate acceptance. I I don't know if you've ever met somebody, and it was like the very first conversation, they immediately opened up their books, and they immediately told you the most, the most hurtful, the most, you know, and they immediately, like, like, and and how many of you have met somebody, and like the first time, you just wanted to, like, hug them and rescue them. I met a pastor like that once. I, I, I felt like he was, he was like the puppy that, that arrived at my doorstep. I just wanted to like bring him in and move him in with us. The problem was that puppy didn't want to be rescued. God's willing. God is willing to bring us from this place into suffer, from suffering into tremendous victory and to give us a a, a Christocentric, a Christ-centric, a gospel-centric worldview for how we can process through suffering. Because suffering can be a season, but it should not become your lifestyle. And what makes the difference is us. Why? Because God has given us the gift of a will. Where we can will to transition from this place, you see that Jesus was, was, was radically a victim. He was unjustly, uh, the stuff that happened to Jesus, it was wrong. And yet Jesus did not take on a victim mentality. In the garden we see, you, you remember the story where Jesus is in the garden, he's talking to his father. And he's pouring out like, like the intimacy that you see there between the father and his son. Like the son is pouring out and saying, like, Father, if, if, there's, if there can be any other way. Now think about this for a second. How many, how many of you have ever had that conversation with God? How many of you have ever had a conversation about your past where you said, God, are you serious? 
Could there not have been any other way? Now, I know what, I know what you're thinking because I'm prophetic. You're thinking, Darren, are you saying that God wills trauma? Darren, are you saying that God ordains trauma for his, for his greater glory? No, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. And yet, I, I can tell you a story uh, for myself. That one time, I came, I came to the Lord and I said, and, and, I, and, I, was, and I, I was really um, unhappy with him because of things that had happened in my past. And I was looking at somebody else's family that, and, they, and they just had it all together. And it, it was Christmas time. And they had all these traditions and they had all these things. And, and, and there was a period of time in my life where, um, where Christmas wasn't the most wonderful time of the year. When Christmas was kind of, was kind of rough and I had to figure out you know, how, to, how to spend time with my mom, how to spend time with my dad. And, and just going through a season of divorce as a child is, is, a, weird, is a weird time. And I remember uh, several years later, uh, uh, Andrea and I were married and, and, uh, and I had my first child. And I was, still, I was still processing through this. And this is why we're talking about today. You can be an, you can be an awesome person, just like I was. <laughs> and still have the scratches. And still be getting bumped back. And I said to the Lord, are you serious? Like, did that have to happen? Looking at my family, like, did that have to happen with that divorce? Did that have to happen? Are you kidding me? Now, this is what the Lord said to me. This, this isn't maybe what the Lord is going to say to you, um, but this is what he, he spoke to me. All right, Darren, you want to be the author of your life? Fine. Rewrite your past. It's like an exercise. It's kind of like what the Lord did with Job. Go ahead. Rewrite your past. Rework it. Make it beautiful. Make it amazing. Get rid of all the, the ugliness. Where does that put you now? It doesn't put you here. It doesn't put you now. Most likely you're not married to Andrea. Most likely Abigail's not your daughter. And most likely you're not pastoring at Seattle Bible Center. You know what changed in me that day? I gave thanks. I let go of that victim thing. It's so fascinating that we see our king not trying to create and manipulate environments where he looks glorious and he sounds amazing and everybody likes him. We see our king who so trusts in himself. We see this incredible rescue mission between the father, the son, and the spirit, where there's so much security within their relationship, there's so much security within their union that they don't have to manipulate happenings in order to create happiness, that they, they have so much trust and so much communion and so much union between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that God, who played with the dust and created mankind, became his own creation, that he became his his own creature of dust and then dwelt among us and he did not crave the attention of a mortal king he gave himself into the pain and the suffering even associating himself with pretty shady people and we see this place where Jesus begins to model something with all this heart, with all this gravity. Uh, you, you, read, you read the story where, where Lazarus is dead and, it, and, and, and you see Jesus enter into that funeral and, and you see the, the gravity of, of, of that, the shortest verse of the Bible where it says, and Jesus wept. We see that God became flesh he lived and then he gave himself unto death. That his life was not taken from him. That, that he gave his life. And there on the cross is Jesus, our victorious king, but he looks defeated. And there is Jesus, our honored king, but it looks like he's being shamed. And there is Jesus, our, our holy king, and he's, and, 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 and he's 
clothed in splendor and clothed in glory, but it looks like he's just covered in blood. And here is Jesus that did not run away from the chaos, but Jesus who entered into it. Jesus gave himself into the chaos. And there on the cross is Jesus the Son, Jesus the Father. And there in the darkness, and there in the lightning, there in the thunder, there in the storm, there Bobby Connor was taken in the spirit to this moment. And he says, this is the most gruesome and demonic scene ever played out in human history. And there in that demonic turmoil is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Why? Couldn't there have been any other way? Jesus became flesh. He had a tender, tender heart. And this is so important because God wasn't going to put a robot up on the cross. He wasn't going to put a droid up on the cross. It had to be real. It had to be anchored in love. It had to be anchored in submission, intimacy, and sacrifice. And for this reason, a lot of times as a people, when we look at the suffering in our cities, when we look at the suffering in our region, when we look at a lot of the stuff that's going on um, right now in, in, in the culture, and listen, um, I don't know what's happening with the election, but I can tell you this, that, that just when we hit New Year's, that's not going to be a magical moment, you know, when, when, um, when the black and white movie turns into color. That's not, you know, um, I, would love, I would love for the, the, the clock to strike midnight, you know, and all of a sudden everything is beautiful and glorious, but, but most likely we're going to see a lot of chaos in 2021. And most likely we're going to see injustice in 2021. Most likely, there's going to be some adversity. Most likely, there's going to be a place where we're really going to have to pray. and We're really going to have to seek God. And yet, the Lord is not going to send his androids out into the world to bring forth the good news of the gospel. The Lord's not going to send us out as robots. He's going to send us out as his sons. That on that day, on the cross, our suffering king, it had to be flesh and blood, emotion. It had to be real. That Jesus came as the true and perfect Adam because the first Adam didn't do a very good job. He was presented with, with a choice and he chose his own self-ambition. He chose his, his own self-lordship. Adam and Eve rebelled against God, but here comes Jesus and he does not choose his own self-ambition. He chooses the tree of the cross. He chooses the tree of his love and he gives himself this flesh and blood, this Emmanuel, this God with us that he doesn't run away he doesn't blame. He goes in because of love. And he suffers well. But this suffering presents the doorway to victory. Because now all of mankind get to receive the benefits of this triumph. Because he was willing to go in. Because he was willing to love and to serve and to die. We can't take the old us into a new year. Why? The new year needs a new us. There is a changing of the guard. That doesn't mean you have to find a new church. It means we need to allow for the hearts of the guard to be transformed. And this means that any area of the past that is still defining who we are or any sort of suffering within the past that's acting and serving like an anchor where we can't quite get free of it. Usually, I can't cast that out as a demon. Why? Because I can't override your will. It takes for a people that, that, that say, yes. That happened. It was radically unfortunate. God did not will that. But I know that if I can see that through his eyes, if I can forgive, if I can forgive those who have hurt me, if I'm willing to acknowledge what has happened, if I'm willing to acknowledge that God was there, all of a sudden, before we know it, we wake up to this revelation that our authority is framed out through the testimony of Jesus 
right, which is the spirit of prophecy, that they overcame the enemy with the blood of the lamb and the word of their, let's try it again, all right. They overcame the enemy with the blood of the lamb and the word of their, they overcame the enemy with the blood of the lamb that washed them and cleansed them and the word of their testimony. And that means that your testimony frames out your authority if you will activate your will and say, I refuse to allow the past to, to define me as a victim. Jesus is my victorious king. And if his suffering made way for a platform of love and righteousness uh, to be established for generations and nations, then I can suffer well in this present moment knowing that this is not going to be a season. This is going to be a thing, and I'm going to get through it. And if you are still living in a season of suffering now, but that thing began in like 1980s, okay, that's not a season. That's a lifestyle, and it's time to say, today, I will move forward. I will press on towards the prize. I will give thanks to the Lord because he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And now because of that, I might walk with a limp. But because of that limp, most likely other people are actually going to trust me. Because I don't know about you, but I don't trust people that don't walk with a limp. And that's why I love our leadership team here at Seattle Revival Center. Why? Because when I look at our elders, when I look at our leaders, I see mature ones who have lived well. They've been through stuff, man. They've been through rejection, betrayal, and yet they chose to not allow the past to define them. They allowed the past to somewhat shape them. They have hearts of empathy and compassion and grace and mercy. And so that when our leaders at SRC speak, there's gravity on their words. Therefore, Hebrews 4.14, we have a high priest, a great high priest who ascended into heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. There was a great theologian, John Stott, and yes, we're related. So if you want to touch me after the service, that'd be okay. He put out a, um, uh, a book, and in the book, he was talking about Jesus and, and the crucifixion. And he said, I could never believe in Jesus if it wasn't for the cross. How could I trust in the Savior to process with me through my suffering when that Savior was immune from all suffering. Isn't this incredible? Guess what? Today, you get to come before his throne of grace as a son and as a daughter, without shame, with confidence, knowing no matter what you have gone through, no matter what you are going through, you have a high priest who stinking gets it. He gets it. Can I tell you something? Religion doesn't get it. Religion will always try to give you little hacks and little formulas, little ways to, to cope. But, but that's not what Jesus said. There's not a formula. There's just him. There's not three ways. Of, there's just him. And if you're willing to come to Jesus today, guess what? He's willing to come to you, but he's not willing to override your will. And if you are willing today to, to say, I will move forward. I will move through this scratch if Jesus, if you will allow your oil to come to allow me to process to go through it. This is really important. <laughs> and the reason why this is really important is because hurting people hurt people. But healed up people will heal people. 
And if we are going to call ourselves ministers, we're going to have to be very familiar with pain and suffering, but familiar with it, not at the expense of worshiping it or appreciating it. I'm going to read you some scriptures, and then I'm going to land this thing. So if Elizabeth and Daniel want to come. That doesn't mean to go use the bathroom now, because this is going to be the best part of the message. I know you got to go. So do I. We're going to make it. All right, here we go. 1 Peter 4.13, rejoice. Declare that with me. Rejoice. 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 Say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. So when you rejoice, I'm sorry, when you suffer, make sure that you realize that is an opportunity to rejoice. That's what he says here. What? That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. He says this, when times get tough, rejoice. Why? His glory dwarfs that trial. His glory makes a mockery out of that trial. Romans 8.18 says this. This is Paul. Paul's a gangster. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us for all of creation groans and waits for the revealing of the manifested sons. This is what Paul is saying. Yeah, my life is rough. Yeah, like, like Paul's like, I die daily, meaning that I literally almost die daily. And this is what Paul says. Yeah, like it kind of sucks to be me, and yet at this time, it's, it's not even worth talking about. That this suffering is not worth comparing to the glory of God that is to be revealed to us. This is what I know. His glory is big and great and all powerful. And because we have a revelation of his future glory, we can go through anything in the present. Why? His grace and glory is sufficient. That we see Christ Jesus, and it's almost like the adversity, the turmoil. It's almost like that's always an invitation. It's almost like the suffering is an invitation. It's like, it's like whenever Jesus would see suffering, it's like inside there was rejoicing because he realized that injustice is just an opportunity for the king of glory to manifest the shalom of heaven within that particular matter. And this is what I know. That we get, you know, I... I I just watched Wonder Woman. And I wrestled with it. Why? Because I didn't really care about her. Right? Like here you've got this woman that's indestructible. Like not, not, not that woman, but she's, she's indestructible. Like you can't, do, you can't do nothing. Like she's just like, how do, you, how do you relate with that? Oh, she doesn't have a boyfriend. So what? That's her choice. She could... T- <laughs> You, you see Superman, and it's hard. Those writers, they got to work so hard to be able to get us to relate with Superman. Why? It's the man of steel. You, it's a bird. No, it's a plane. No, it's Superman. Who cares? That's not the picture that we've been given at all. That Jesus wasn't bulletproof, and he wasn't emotionally distant. He was so vulnerable. Jesus was so fragile. He was so easy to break. And that's what should set us apart. That's what should set us apart from the rest of the world. Is that like the superheroes, we have a desire to execute justice. To render that place of victory, that place where sin, death, sickness and disease it has been overcome by Christ Jesus on the cross and yet he's not going to send in robots to change the world he's going to send in vulnerable at times broken real flesh and blood with real issues that are vulnerable that are open that are willing